um, you know, we're delighted to have Ian Lister um, speak to us this evening. Um, one of the things that we do um, with our website is to collect testimonials of uh, individuals, about their families, about the communities they lived in, um, uh, with anecdotes as well as uh, you know, of the time, cultural uh, insights. Um, and this evening is really an opportunity to uh, witness a, a living testimonial. Ian will talk about his family, his father, his grandfather um, in uh, Constant Constantinople, as was Istanbul now, of course, um, and share some insights into um, almost 100 years uh, of experience there. Ian's background um, uh, starts really with going to school in Istanbul, English school for boys, um, but was also educated in the UK and used to return to Istanbul uh, for his holidays. Um, and uh, he's now retired, but he uh, has a background in printing and publishing and his family connections, uh, like so many uh, from the region, um, have a rich mix, uh, including Italian stock. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen now. I'm going to hand over to um, Ian, uh, supported by Jane. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, the screen is yours. Right, thank you. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Right, fine. Can they see the first picture? Sorry? The two on the first picture. Yeah. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a copy of this book, Memorials of an Ancient House. And there's really nothing to do with Istanbul, but I'll get on to that. But the Reverend Henry Littleton Lister Denny, MA, decided to create a tome co covering all the Listers. And it was privately published in 1913. And it's about nearly 400 pages of immense research. And I'm lucky enough to have a copy. This is a page which covers our own family. At the top, you'll see Alfred James Lister in Ottoman Bank, Constantinople. And that is the beginning of the Lister family starting in Turkey. He was sent from, the, from London to Constantinople and was with the bank for quite a few years. <clears throat> he married Marie Antoinette Danino, <clears throat> and she was Italian, <clears throat> daughter of a the Dragoman Italian embassy. Now, the, the Dragoman was a Mr. Fixit. <clears throat> he may have had a uniform and had a bit of official business but his main business was to bribe people to get things done. <clears throat> so you had to be very clever, be a dragon man, have your wits about you. And I think my grandmother was like that. She was very, very quick witted. There are three sons, Henry, my father, James Leslie, who died as an infant, Frederick John, my uh, uncle Freddie, and um, Edith Marie Valerie Lister who became Mrs. Stack after she married. Okay. Now, my grandmother went to school in Turkey and though she was born Italian, you can see that she was brought up as an English girl. Because her father died, her mother remarried and he remarried the harbour master of Istanbul or Constantinople, which was a very big job, of course. And as such, she was brought up as an English girl, and you can see her perfect English. Unfortunately, it's not dated, but it's, it proves that she was brought up as an English girl, although she was Italian, okay? This is my grandfather, Alfred James, <clears throat> with my father, and I'm not sure who the other child is. It could be the daughter who died young, or it could be Uncle Freddie, or it could be Aunt Tizza. It's interesting that the, the, the wording underneath appears to be Cyrillic, but not Greek. It seems to be Russian. 
So perhaps there was a Russian photographer in the city. Um, my father in this picture on the left, a young boy, has an unca uncanny resemblance to my daughter Jane's eldest boy. You really would think it's the same person. So the family has come through. Okay, next. I, I asked the Ottoman Bank if they had any details of my grandfather, and they came up with this depot de titre, Alfred Lister, uh, address BIO, Bank Imperial Ottoman, a Galata. So I was interested to see that he was actually employed by the embassy, but by the bank there. Okay, Jane. My grandmother spent the whole of World War I in the city. Her own mother was elderly and couldn't travel. And though her husband went back to England, worked with the Ottoman Bank, she stayed behind. Now, I don't know exactly what that is. There's a date on there which doesn't seem to make sense. Um, I've, I've checked it in Arabic and it doesn't seem to make sense at all. So I don't know exactly what it is, but it just shows that she had permission to stay in Turkey during the hostilities. And of course there were, um, what's the word? There's a word for people who live in the country with their belligerents. She was a non-belligerent, um, um, I forget the word they used for her, but the poor woman had to spend the whole of the war in Constantinople knowing that her husband and her children were in England and not being able to do very much because she was looking after her aged mother. To help things go a, a bit better money-wise, she took in lodgers, and of course lodgers would have been Christians, and she was putting up Germans. So we had this clash of personality where she was English and they were fighting the Germans and she had to look after Germans. And the her, her I've got three books of her memoirs, and she goes on in great depth about them, um, how they were not very nice people, how they complained all the time. <coughs> but it was a relief for her to be able to talk to somebody. She had a maid, of course, as well. Keep it on. This is a page from her diary. There are three books of the diary, and this one is 1st November 1918. Peace for us, all saints and all souls be prayed. The dear Lord has given us peace. Armistice was signed yesterday. And it goes on and on and on. And um, I thought that particular page would be particular interest. Uh, she, spent, she spent the whole of the war there. And things which are not probably very well known that living in Constantinople during the war, they were bombed by British planes. I don't think many people know that, but there were some small fighter bombers sighted on one of the Greek islands, and they flew at the end of their range, I would have thought, to Constantinople and dropped firebombs. And of course, in the Turkish part of the city, all the buildings are made of wood, so the firebombs made tremendously a lot of, diff you know, tremendous damage. And she does go on about that, but there are three pages, three books of her memoirs, and they are difficult to decipher. I've only just given you this one page, which I thought was relevant. Peace for us. Okay, Jane. Now, this is my father, <coughs> and he was sent to Turkey with the Lancashire Fusiliers. Nothing to do with Lancashire at all. But <coughs> For some reason, he, he was sent with the Lancashire Fusiliers. <coughs> and um, when he got there, um, he was actually at the Dardanelles in the fighting. And um, again, his memoirs cover everything that happened in great detail. But he all seemed to manage to talk about what they had to eat. <laughs> Going on about bully beef stew all the time. Um, <coughs> Uh, at the end of the campaign, they were about to be taken back to UK to fight on the Western Front. And somebody passing by heard my father talk to one of the locals. So he said to my father, what language are you speaking? And he said, Greek, sir. How do you speak Greek? 
well, I've lived in Istanbul, Constantinople most of my life. So I speak Greek and I speak Turkish and I have a bit of Bulgarian and Armenian. So very interesting, very interesting. So my father thought he'd be going back to the Western Front. And the next day he was told that he wasn't going to the Western Front. He was going to stay behind and be a, um, a interpreter. And um, he complained bitterly saying he wanted to be with his regiment, but he was outranked and had to stay behind. These are the medals he picked up during that campaign. And people, when they get the site, when they, if they read the citation of Dad's MC, they say, 1920, the war was over in 1918. What's 1920 did you got to do with it? So could you move on? This is a citation. Lord of the Military Cross, Henry Newbold Lister, for gallantry and devotion to duty on the 14th of June, 1920, during the Isthmian operations against the Nationalist forces, when dispatched under heavy rifle machine gun fire with a message to the anti-nationalists we succeed with, which he succeeded in delivering. His intelligence work throughout the operation was invaluable. So he stayed on because he was taken away from his Lancashire Fusiliers to the intelligence corps. And he got his MC in 1920, which of course is very unusual. <clears throat> Following the, um, the end of the hostilities, Another citation, you just get that one up. For the next slide. Yeah. yeah. This is another part of the citation. Third Battalion, London Regiment, attached to the Intelligence Corps, 1922. Okay, so um, he then, before he went out, before he, he worked for the Ottoman Bank, as I've mentioned. And can we go on to another one? And I have this document, which is 1911 census. And you can see that he was living in Harrow when he was working for the Ottoman Bank. <clears throat> right. Okay. Next slide. Now, this is my grandfather. He looks a real bundle of fun, doesn't he? A very, very stiff man. Never smiled, very, very stiff when his, his wife, my grandmother, was a much more cheerful and outgoing person. I think this photograph was taken in Nice. I don't quite know why we have it. And it's not labelled at all. But I think after the war, they just travelled. They lived in Ealing in London and um, they travelled quite a bit. Okay. Now, this is my brother with my grandmother and there's me with my mother. This is in the garden of 49 Gordon Road, Ealing. My father left Turkey but before the, the Second World War started. I don't quite know why. I got the idea, it's never been mentioned, but hinted at, that he was doing a little bit of undercover spying and passing information on to the British. And all of a sudden he was given 48 hours to leave the country. And of course, um, his, his, his children, me and, my, me and my brother, had to go back with him. I never got to the bottom of why they came back so suddenly. My mother had never been outside Turkey, didn't really speak English at all, and she had a little baby, me. And my brother was much older than me, and that's him with my grandmother, with our grandmother. <clears throat> so Alan was about 11 or 12 at the time. He hardly spoke English because he'd been brought up speaking French and Greek. <clears throat> and my grandfather thought that this was ridiculous. He's an English boy. I want him to have the best education I can. And we were all Catholics, of course. So they sent him to Stonyhurst College, which was a big change, of course, in his lifestyle. And he, he loved it at Stonyhurst. He played sport, he played rugby, he swam. He was a very good sportsman. And so he was now totally and utterly British, though he had this rather strange background. 
the, the, the next thing happened was that dad came back to England during the, during the Second World War and mother came with him and we went to live with a relation of my father's, this is Stack, this is, um, sorry, um, uh, so I forgot their name, um, Sparks, Mrs. Sparks. Her husband had been the local MP for Mid Devon and had a very nice house in Dawlish Warren. And um, we went and stayed with her. And my father got a job, my mother got a job locally speaking, teaching French at a local school. So my first education in this country was in Dawlish. <laughs> then when the war finished, um, dad came back very briefly and then he was sent out to the canal zone and we were told to join him in the canal zone having uh, being, uh, lived at um, in, in Dawlish and Exeter for the whole of the war and um, <clears throat> we, we, we took uh, the Britannic from Liverpool to Port Said and we were moved to somewhere on Ismailia on Lake Tisma on the, on the Suez Canal to a transit camp waiting to be moved back to Istanbul. The unusual thing about this transit camp was that the servants and the gardeners were all German prisoners of war. They were all part of Rommel's army and they'd been, they, they were, if they volunteered for the work, they could do it. They, they couldn't be forced into it under the Geneva, Geneva connection for prisoners of war. I'd always believed that Germans were all nasties. And of course, we'd all seen pictures of the Belsen camps and the horrible happenings there. And you couldn't have met a nicer bunch of lads, you really couldn't. I used to wander in and out of their billets and they sort of all gave me sweets and talked to me and they were lovely, lovely lads. And it completely changed, <coughs> changed my opinion of the Germans, which of course was a good thing. We then, my father was then moved back to Istanbul and we took a boat from Port Said moving up the Mediterranean to Istanbul, stopping off at um, Haifa. We weren't allowed to get off the boat at Haifa because that was a time when the um, Palestinians were fighting the freedom fighters and they were worried if British people were seen they might get killed. So we weren't allowed to get off the boat, but we took the boat up the coast to Mersin and to Izmir and eventually on to Istanbul where the, the, the pilot boat came out to meet us and dad was on the pilot boat. He was very good at blagging his way into anything. And when he wore his uniform, he was quite a big man. When he wore his uniform, local people just did exactly what he said. They thought he had authority, which he didn't, but he just blagged his way through it. So we turned up on the um, pilot boat and um, we sort of became a family living in Istanbul. Um, my mother's family were all Levantines, of course, and they were Italians, basically. They made a lot of money out of, guess what, importing spaghettis and pasta. They were from Genoa. And my, as I said, my father had married into that family. But as they were both Catholics, there's no problem with religion. And um, so the family had the Italian family, Le Vitalis and Dandria, two families. They had a lot of property. And one of the properties they owned was the Grand Hotel de Londres, which is probably the second or third best hotel in Istanbul. And for a few weeks, we just stayed there till my dad could find places for us to live. My mother's family had three blocks of flats, which they uh, owned, and they managed to find a flat for us to live in. But it was on the sixth floor with no lift. It didn't worry me very much, but of course my father and my mother didn't like the fact that 101 stairs go up and down. I was then enrolled into the English High School for Boys, and that was about 15 minutes away on the tram. And I was looking forward to getting back to school because I'd had nine months without any schooling. And um, in September 47, I started school there. Some of you might have heard of this school. 
which was very much second rate to Robert College, which is a more technical college, but it was a good school. Most of the teachers were, English, well, they were English speaking, but they read English. They were mostly Jewish or Greek or some such local nationality. Um, the classes of about 15 to 20 boys. And in my class, I had um, two lots of Americans. The, the Hutton boys, Powell and Churchill, were my best friends. And um, their father was the local consul at the, at the um, the, the American consulate. The other one was um, the local agent for Associated Press. So these were two educated American boys who became my best friends. And I, I saw an awful lot of them. And I didn't meet very much Turkish or Greek or um, Armenians who were the other occupiers of the school. Mr. Peach was the headmaster. and. Um, yeah, he had to, he was this disciplinarian, which was needed in a school like that. And um, I had four fairly, fairly happy years there, but because the, the normal term of office for a consul or somebody in business was only two or three years, my American friends all disappeared. And I began to get more friendly with the local English boys and the local Turkish boys always speaking English, of course. Um, we had a talk about the Whittles a few weeks ago, did we not? And one of the Whittles was at school with me, but he wasn't in a family which came up in the talk given a few weeks ago. He was a few years older than me. And there's another chap called Neil Baker, I'm not quite sure what happened to him. So I had four and a half years at English High School for Boys. Quite enjoyed it, the, the tuition was quite good standard. But my father felt that my brother had the advantage of a Sony Hertz British Catholic education and I shouldn't do without. So they found another school for me called Dowie Abbey near Reading. And I was sent in 1940, 1951 to become a boarder at Dowie Abbey Benedictine School near Reading, where, where I was very, very happy because I learned to play rugby there and that's been the basis of my sporting life ever since. So that took me back to, um, to that took me back to England. But the family in Turkey carried on and um, Uncle Joe was my mother's brother. We, we, had a, a, we had a property on the Bosphorus at Yenikoy on the European side of the Bosphorus, there's a lovely plot of land. I mentioned before that most of the houses were wood. And unfortunately, this house caught fire and it was just a plot of land. And we used to go there for picnics and there was a sort of hut on the land and we could keep knives and forks and things like that there and a primer stove and paraffin. And then the summer we used to go there and have picnics overlooking the Brosphorus of the wonderful view across the Brosphorus on the heights of Yenikoi. Dad in the meantime was working at the embassy. He got the job of security officer and was in charge of about a dozen uniformed staff who uh, did the chauffeuring and things like that, gardening and chauffeuring. <coughs> it, it, he had to meet the British, he had to meet the Queen's messengers once a fortnight. They came in on the plane and he had to meet them, take the official bags and put them in a security overnight. And they, then they were signed for. And then very often the Queen's Messenger used to come back to our house and have a meal with us. And they were the most interesting of men. And I thoroughly enjoyed sitting in on these conversations. They'd all had military experience. And as such, uh, Dad, he they got on very well. The, the Vitalis family, which was mother's side, managed to find this flat for us. And the Pera or the Beolu area was very, very westernized. There were three Catholic churches within walking distance of the flat and only one mosque. The mosque was very small. So I find myself getting more and more involved in my mother's relations 
we, I'm not complaining about that at all. They were nice people. They all spoke English, but they were all pleased to speak to me in English. But of course, I picked up a lot of French. Though they were Italian, they all seemed to speak French together. I don't quite know why. <coughs> the um, the um, as I said, I was when I was fourteen. I, I went back to the UK and was boarder at some uh, Dowry Abbey in, in, near, near Reading. Uh, my parents carried on living in Turkey and um, the Cyprus crisis arose and my father was well into his 60s and he was asked if he wanted to go to Cyprus in the special branch seeing he spoke the languages. So he jumped at the chance to get a fairly well-paid job as opposed to the job he was doing where he was locally employed at the embassy. So he went out to Nicosia and he even interviewed uh, Archbishop Makarios once, but his job was to interview the, uh, Aoka and Enosis suspects. I don't think his Greek was particularly good. He certainly couldn't read it, but he spoke better Greek than most British people. So he would question them and write things down in English. And I don't really know what happened to the guys he was questioning. <laughs> the um, the flat we were living in was very basic. We were living on the sixth floor, and there were five flats below us which were occupied. Flat number three was occupied by my grandmother and my uncle, and um, we had a concierge or kapuji, and the flats had uh, no central heating, and all heating was done with the wood burner and the wood burner was a large stove which had trunking going from the back of it all the way through the flats so the trunking had heat in it and it heated up all the um, rooms as it went as, as the, the fumes and the smoke went through it and heated up the rooms there was electric light but there was no electric heating there was a uh, what they call a kazani which was a, a system which had a wood fire underneath. And we could, we could heat water for washing and the maid came in and did all the washing for us. So it was fairly basic um, living, but it was a flat and we lived, of course, rent free. The rents from the flats were collected by one of my uncles, Uncle Steve, and he shared it all out. Um, month once he collected the rent, he shared it out. So though my father was locally employed at the embassy, which didn't pay him particularly well, there was additional income coming in from the flats, which had about a dozen different occupants, the three blocks of flats. My, my uncle Joe worked for Shell and became the accountant for Shell. Again, he wasn't qualified, but the Vitalis, as I mentioned before, are quite clever people, and he soon picked it up and was uh, the accountant for Shell. The, um, so my time in Turkey finished in 1951, apart from school holidays when I went back in the summer and all my American friends had disappeared, of course, by then, gone back to their home country. And I, I began to become more friendly with the local English boys who I'd met at school, who now, of course, were working. The fact that I had a I'd been born in the UK, gave me a higher level of kudos locally. Um, when the Turk met you, the first thing they said is, where were you born? And if you said London, your, your, your status went up, as opposed to somebody who said they were born locally. So I was rather lucky there. But I was friendly with local English boys who had local mothers. And every summer I used to go back to Istanbul. Right, so that's my background in Turkey. I just want to go on to, um, can you find the next? But there was a pilgrimage. The queen came to Turkey in 1971, going on quite a bit, obviously. 
and this is my father being introduced to the Queen when she visited Turkey in 1971. Okay. I, I, and these are pictures of the family graves. Frederick John Lister was my uncle, but because he wasn't in the Vitalis or the Dandria families, he was given his own graveyard. Whereas you can see my mother and my, my father and my mother were put into a vault which belonged to the Vitalis family. I haven't seen that vault for some time. I always feel I must go back sometime and pay homage, but it's um, a Christian cemetery in the Shishli area of Istanbul. Some of you might know it, I don't know. Okay, so we move on to, and I did, had a career in the printing industry and publishing and um, I suppose my job with the biggest kudos was I was production, production services director at Oxford University Press printing division but I took other jobs in the um, printing industry and my, my wife Jill wasn't happy in Oxford, was a little bit snobbish there. If you hadn't got a degree, you really were sort of fodder. And so I managed to get a job back in Liverpool, which Jill was very happy with. And I did a few years there and then eventually I, I retired. And I decided that I ought to do something with the copious list of memoirs. And I decided that they needed to be published. So I spent a lot of time going through all my dad's, dad's copious notes and um, speaking to my cousins about various things. And can you go to the next one, here, please? And this book was a result. Diaries from World War One. I went all the way through the um, diaries which my father had kept, which were nearly all from hindsight. But my grandmother's diaries, as the page I showed you early earlier, was all from actually happened that day. So I did two sections. The first section was my grandmother's diaries. And I, I paraphrased and, and, and described some of the situations she was on. But my father's side was his diaries. And this all took place really just after the First World War. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that he was stopped from going back to UK with the Lancashire Fusiliers. He was put into an intelligence corps. And he was then attached to some Bulgarian bandit, that's the only word you could use for them. And they were harassing the Turkish troops. So as such, they were pro-British. And he lived with these bandits for quite a time and had to report to the British, local British officers. And his job, of course, was to um, get them all on our side and bribe them to be as much nuisance to the Turks as possible. And the book has got some photographs of these guys and they really look like bandits or horseback with big beards and wearing shaggy clothes. So that was quite an experience for him. <clears throat> and um, the book had moderate success. I think there is still stock of it available. I didn't expect to get rich from it. I really thought that I'm very lucky to get it published. And as such, there was a, a, a memento to my mother, my grandmother, my father in print. And if anybody's further interested, then of course it's still available through um, Amazon. <laughs> this book, another page. This book was translated into Turkish with the same title, Among the Ottomans. And it's a photograph of my father in the middle with, un with my, uh, my uncle Freddy and my grandfather. I don't quite know where it was taken, 
and I, I, I didn't know that Freddie was ever in Turkey, but it looks like he managed to get himself to Turkey as well. But how they all managed to get together, and I'm not quite sure where that photograph comes from, I haven't got a copy of it, so somebody must have found it somewhere. And there's another book, another, another story here. Yep. Forgotten Battlefields of First World War. And somebody called Martin Marix Evans contacted me when he saw my book and asked if I could help him create this book. And it's a very, very, very well researched. And it's just what it says, Forgotten Battlefields of the First World War. And um, he asked me all sorts of questions and I looked at all the notes I could find and I gave him um, uh, in the information that I had. And there's a whole chapter in the, um, in the book, I forget what the chapter is actually called now, but um, it's quite obvious what it is. It's the last chapter in the book and he gives, he gives um, credit to my father for having made these notes and, and, and um, he's, he's, he's printed them in the, in the book. It's a very interesting book, again, very, very well researched. So that basically is my, my time in Turkey. It was a um, very different sort of story. Um, you know, when I got to school and you know, people asked, where did you come from? I said, no, I come from Istanbul. Are you Turkish? No, I'm English. That the interest immediately faded, you know. Nobody at school was particularly interested in the fact that I came, I'd been in Istanbul and spoke Turkish. What, why should they? It was an English boarding school and everybody did their, did their lessons in English and we all had stories to tell of the First World War. But um, that's basically it. Uh, I thought this might last a little bit longer, but it hasn't lasted that long. Um, yep. Well, Ian, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating uh, uh, account. Um, uh, if you'd like to stop sharing and uh, then we can move to questions, comments uh, that people have. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for that. Um, hello, and, and hello. Actually, hello, Michael. You're, you're my cousin. Hello, well, Michael. Um, so what we'll do is, um, if you've got a question, comment, uh, you can uh, wave your hand if, you're, if your screen is on, you can use the chat function or use the Zoom, raise your hand. And while you're thinking about what you might want to ask Ian, um, if I can just sort of lead off. I mean, Ian, you actually raised at the end the question I, I wanted to ask was um, really about uh, how did you identify? <laughs> I mean, you were clearly, your family was clearly strongly British, but um, in your early years, what, what languages uh, were spoken in the house? Well, French. Yeah. French. Well, her parents spoke French to each other. Yeah. Uh, even though she was Italian, she, she, they did, all of the family spoke French to each other. And when my American friends came to our house and my parents spoke French to each other, I said, elbow them and speak English, speak English. And I said, no, we, we speak French to each other. I don't see why we should change. And that did, not, that did, did embarrass me that uh, the French was spoken in the language, in the family, but English to me. And surprisingly, when it came to O level, I failed my French the first time round. <laughs> I got 28 out of 30 for verbal and 12 out of 30 for my dictate because I didn't speak, didn't write it very well. But everybody, some, some of the family spoke Italian, but everybody spoke French to each other. But did you have English when you were a, a small boy? Oh, yes. You had that as well. So your parents spoke English to you as well. I spoke English to my parents, certainly. And um, all my, all the relations spoke English as well. All uh, my mother's family all spoke perfect English. And my cousin, Annie, who more or less my age, her mother was Maltese 
And when Uncle Steve, Steve, that's my mother's brother, Uncle Steve, by the way, he ran a small French language paper in Istanbul, but it didn't do very much. He had to give it up. Um, that it was just called Journal d'Oria. Anyway, um, when my aunt, when my Uncle Steve's wife, uh, Julia, she was Maltese, and she was so proud of being Maltese that when she was eight months pregnant, she went back to Malta so that her child could be born in Malta and become British. <laughs> so Annie spoke perfect English and she went to the English high school for girls, the sister school of the, girls, the school I was at. And she eventually got a job at the British Embassy. And um, <clears throat> just a clerical job, but of course, Everybody spoke four languages there. Everybody spoke Greek, Turkish, a bit of Armenian, Italian, um, English. Um, everybody, you just a polyglot family. And Paul Samar is my cousin's son. And he will know how polyglot the family was. Did you speak English to your father, Michael? My, my own muted. Did you speak English to your father? Uh, actually, only English. Mostly English, yes. Yeah, He spoke English to me, but he spoke uh, French to everybody else, didn't he? Yeah, he, he taught me some French, but it didn't all stick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but there was uh, always... Uh, in his generation, it was always French that was spoken. That's right. Even though they were not French, they were all Italian. They yeah. He could speak French for some reason. It was the la langue diplomatique, they called it, didn't they? Right. So French was a major language. Yeah. And, I mean, in, uh, my grandparents um, would speak French at home, um, Greek if they didn't want the children to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and they must have spoken English as well, but, uh, yes. Yes. but probably not much Turkish. Well, maybe they spoke Turkish as well, but it was mainly French uh, and Greek and yes, English. That's right, yes. I mean, the Turkish language, of course, was uh, Arabic script until Atashirk changed it in the 20s. So the older Turkish people only knew Turkish script and uh, Atashirk created a new alphabet to take in the various um, way words were pronounced as about a dozen accented characters in the current Turkish language. But, um, yeah. um, but I've got, sorry. A couple of questions coming in here. Um, I'm going to go uh, first to uh, Jonathan Beard, and then I've got a question on chat from Gareth Winrow. So, Jonathan, first, please. Thank you very much, Quentin. This is fascinating. Um, Afraid I missed the first ten minutes because the Istanbul traffic is just terrible. It gets worse, <laughs> worse and worse. And you probably remember what Istanbul traffic was like. It must be worse then. now. It must be worse now. Yes, eighteen million people and it's absolute chaotic. Um, a couple of things. Uh, terribly interesting. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Honestly, um, do you remember the Istanbul Club? Oh yes. In Taksim. Oh yes, yes. Uh, the my, my father wanted to join it, but he couldn't afford the sub, and so, um, so they turned a blind eye to the fact that he wasn't a member. And he used mm. to go there with uh, uh, an uncle, an uncle Cyril Jones. Um, I won't go right. into that; it's another side of the family. But mm. I used to pick him up there. You know, I used to go to the club and pick him up and take him home or not because he was drunk or anything but that's somewhere I used to go so I knew the Istanbul club well yes. My father Hugh Beard and my mother Elizabeth Beard uh, were frequent uh, visitors of the Istanbul club and I remember I must have been five six years old uh, going there right. and what 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 Taksim used to be and what it is now is just so terribly different. Is it right? Yeah, it, it, it was about a, a, a fast 12 minute walk from the British High School for Girls. Yes. In, and I, I, I actually went to the British High School for Girls. Did you write? 
uh, before I was allowed to be, before I, I, I went on to prep school in England. Right. And, was, and when, was a, a junior school that was uh, in the yeah. school. Yeah. yeah at, at the time, uh, uh, Miss, Mrs. Thompson. Oh, yes. Yes. Was the headmistress. Yes. And, uh, and, and I, I, uh, I, I also took my common entrance exam and, and failed it because my English was so poor. <laughs> what happened but, afterwards? Did you go eventually to English school? I did eventually go to England and, and, and then I was sent off to the continent to be educated in, 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 in Switzerland and France, only because the family business is in this part of the world. Nice. You see. And we too, picking up on what Quentin, our chairman, said a moment ago, uh, we at home, uh, being Levantines, uh, we spoke to each other in French because all the family are francophone, uh, in English, in Turkish, in Arabic. And it was only grandmother and, uh, and, uh, that would speak Greek. So, so we had four living languages yes, yes. around the, around the, 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 the table. Yes. And, and only because one could express themselves so clearly in each one of those languages. Did you have Armenian as well? No, afraid not. No, oh, right. We had afraid Armenian not. made for one time, and that was a very difficult language, the different alphabet completely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And, and lastly, uh, before, before uh, passing the microphone on, um, the photograph that you showed of your father, I believe you said, meeting Her Majesty in yes. 1971 in, in the garden of Pera House. That was in the embassy, yes. It, it was the consul gen, consul yes, general. Uh, we always call it the embassy, but of course, technically, of course, it was the embassy. Of, of, of course, of course. Well, in actual fact, I was there. Were you? And I remember the moment that your father was talking to Her Majesty. Wow! Wow! <laughs> oh, thanks very much. Yes. <laughs> I looked. I looked, and I said to myself, I must at the time have been. Well, I have to calculate. It's not so terribly difficult. Forty years. Ago. So I was, I was twenty, or no, it's eighty nineteen, I think. And and I, up, and I looked up at your father. He was a very grand man. He was a big man, yes. I may say, yes, yes, indeed. And I said, oh, I hope one day I am as, as as strong a figure as he is. Right. Yeah. He managed to. Um, exudes authority and he did, not have, he did not always have that authority but particularly if he had a uniform on the Turks just ran around you know if they if he'd said eat the dirt they would have got down and eaten it he was so mm. much in charge just barked out orders left right and center and people tended to obey him because he looked as if he was in charge and he was only a captain it wasn't as if he was a shadow or a colonel yeah. that that me to one other point, if I may, and that is George and uh, Jane Bean. No, I don't know that name. Oh, okay, fine. Then we won't go there. Uh, but, 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 uh, but, but I, I know that uh, the chair and our secretary general Craig is arranging um, a meeting in London on, I believe, it's the eleventh of of November, and I shall be there. So. If by chance you can be in London, it'll be wonderful to, to talk and over a glass of wine. Well, send me the details, yes. Send me an email, the details. Yeah. Um, okay, we, yeah. can, we can help with that. Um, thank you. Gareth, do you want to ask yeah. your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Ian, for a great talk. Um, by the way, my wife's uncle, uh, Neji Baraduru, was studying at the... Um, High school for boys in the 1930s. So probably a little bit before your time with the Mango Brothers, Andrew and Cyril. No, didn't know those names. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're some famous historians and uh, whatever. Um, my question is, um, going back to your grandparents, maybe from the memoirs. Maybe you may recall. I, I did read your, that book uh, um, that you that you ed edited. Um, 
but in your grandparents, I wonder if they knew the Robinson or Robinson family who were living in Istanbul before and after the First World War. Um, one of the mm -hmm. sons, Amit Robinson, was a famous sports person. They were linked with the YMCA as well, so perhaps more of an American connection. But I know that they, they were well known in the sort of um, British embassy at the time. So I'm just wondering to what extent the, your grandparents mingled with other members of the um, English community in Istanbul at that time, and if the name Robinson rings a bell in any way. Not to me, but though my father was a Catholic and my mother and I used to go to church, he never bothered to join us. But do you know what I mean by Baluk Bazaar? Mm -hmm. The fish market was yep. right next door to the consulate. Yep. And um, th there were bars in the fish bar, just bars serving uh, snacks and beer. And he, crea he created a club in this one of the one of these bars, which they called the church, so they could all say they'd be the church on Sundays. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so they used to go. Mother and I used to go to church proper, and Dad was saying he'd go to his church. And about five or six of the cronies used to meet and have a beer together mm -hmm. in, in the fish market. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Anyone else want to ask? Um, in a question, otherwise I have something else. Um, okay, I will go. Uh, Ian, um, do, do your um, grandfather's diaries cover much about his work at the Imperial Ottoman Bank? And, no. and, and, and how was that set up and what, was it run by expats? Yes, I believe so. It was 50% British owned, of 40% French owned and 10% Turkish owned. But it was taken over by the Merkez Bankasi uh, later. Um, something I forgot to mention, I must mention this, it's quite a story. My dad, working at the British Embassy, sorry, at the Ottoman Bank in London, was told after the, once hostility had started, to go to the Paris branch of the Ottoman Bank and take all the gold from the vaults and bring it back to the UK. Now you'd think he'd have five people with him, wouldn't you? I don't know how much gold there was, but he went there. And I've all since discovered that he had a message to give to a Turkish envoy that the Ottoman Bank would give Turkey 10 million pounds if they stayed on side. And when he got there to meet this person, nobody turned up. And he discovered later that the Germans had given them two million pounds, but in gold. So they won the, the battle. And the Turks went in on the German side, as we all know. But Dad, um, I, I know very little else about his Ottoman bank, except the fact that he, he, he got all the gold back from the French vaults. And I, I'm very surprised that there were still trains going to the coast and there were still ferries going across the channel. But he complains bitterly that there was no food available on the ferry. <laughs> and then when he got to the other side, he had to take a train. I don't know how he got the gold onto the train. And, and got to the, the bank in uh, Abchurch Street, it was in the city. And um, <laughs> there was nobody there to take the gold. He just didn't know what to do with it. He had a fortune in gold in his taxi and he didn't know what to do with it. So he managed to find a phone number for one of the managers who very, very begrudgingly you know, came back into town and opened the, um, opened the bank up so he could put all his gold in the vaults. And this guy said to him, uh, well, Mr. Lister, what about the documents that you must have had for bringing this gold in? He said, documents? What documents? Well, you should have declared all this as they cleared in customs. He said, well, yes, a man did run after me shouting. And I said to driver, just can't drive on. <laughs> so he managed to get all that gold into the vault without paying any sort of duty whatsoever. And I th he says in his diaries that he was given 50 pounds, which in those days, you know, was an awful lot of money for what he did. But that was quite the experience. It's, he said, I had a taxi full of gold and didn't know what to do with it. I couldn't do anything with it. 
yes. the yeah, days yeah, yeah. of trust. <laughs> yes, yes. You'd think they would send three or four people, wouldn't you? But they, he just did it on his own. I don't know how much gold it may not have been that much. Yeah. And in the during the first world war, when your grandparents were um, having to sort of put up uh, Germans, uh, um, was there any um, sort of stigma with that amongst? The... No, no. But my it was only my grandmother who was there. Dad was already fighting, and oh. her, her husband, my grandfather, were already back in the UK. So Granny was alone in the flat. And as I say, um, the Germans there would rather have a Christian landlady than a Turkish one. And so she put up two or three Germans doing various jobs. She didn't like them very much, but because she had a, a German lodger, she was able to get certain rations which enabled her to have more food than usual. And um, she describes in quite some detail in the diaries about these guys, but it's too much to mention in this, in this short talk. But she had three or four different lodges coming and going. And as I said, the Germans would rather have a Christian bad lady than a, um, a, a Muslim one. Uh, the, the business was all Dutch through the Dutch legation she had to go to the Dutch legation every month and get some money, which my grandfather sent her. And as the Dutch were neutral, of course, they were able to do, excuse me, do this sort of thing. And so um, she got her income from the Dutch. And then, of course, she charged her lodgings. But, of course, food was very, very difficult to get hold of. And were other, I suppose, any, any British... Uh, families would have been interned in Istanbul in, during the First War. Would that be right? I mean, normally... I'm not aware of any, Quentin, no. I'm not no. aware of any. No. She, okay. um, she mentions, I mean, the books are, it's all handwritten. If you, if you remember the page I showed you, it's all very difficult to decipher and the ink is faded. And she mentions lots of people, but they mostly have got Greek or French or foreign names. I can't remember any British people. Okay. Um, did, did I mention that there was an air raid? Yes, I did, yes. I don't think that's very well known that the British bombed, you know, Constantinople um, and caused fires. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, good. Um, anyone else want to ask a question of Ian before we close? Um, anything else, Ian, that uh, you're interested in learning about, you know, uh, family connections where you're still interested in finding out more information? Um, I'd like to know what happened to the English School for Boys, certainly. It became, it changed it to something called, uh, something college, not Robert College, of course, was, it became, whether it was still British um, run, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, all the less, all our lessons were in English. And as I say, the teachers were not solely British, but they were English speaking. And um, the Turks had their own lessons of geography and history. We didn't, and that's in Turkish, and we didn't have to attend those. Mm. But um, uh, does anyone know what happened to the English school for boys, Jonathan, do you know? No, seems to be silence. You're mute, no. Okay. I beg your um, pardon. I, 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 have to, I have to say that I think that is absolutely correct, Ian. It became Anadolu Lisese. Yes. This is not college, right? It's Robert yeah. College, Anadolu Lisse, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. the French it's word. It. Right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, but but I, I do not have any further detail, but I certainly can uh, find out more for you. Um, and I think Emin Sartje, um, who's a friend of the LHF, uh, lives here in Istanbul. He would certainly be able to cast more light on uh, what happened. That would be interesting to know, yes, yes. 
I still, feel like, I still speak some Turkish. You know, when I go to Turkish restaurants, I always order in Turkish. And they look at me a bit strange, saying, what language are you speaking? I say, I'm trying to talk Turkish to you. And they're not, not used to hearing it from an Englishman, and they, they don't understand me. Yeah, and just on the, um, the school, I think they still have reunions quite regularly, meetings, so perhaps you can track down from that. Um, I think they had one only a few years ago, so they really? must be on quite yeah. a regular basis, yes. Right. So I don't know exactly, because I know, that, as I said, my wife's uncle was involved in that when he was alive. Um, so I'm sure they must still have regular old boys meetings, as it were. It's never occurred to me to put it on the web and see what came up, yep. but I'd be interested in joining one, yes. yes. Yep. Well, it, it's also a, something for us to think about, you know, is actually tracking some of these uh, schools and see whether we have any uh, references to them uh, amongst other material on the website or other testimonials. It, it's quite possible. Yes. Um, so and we, we can share that. Um, um, so uh, unless there's any anything else you'd like to ask Ian or Ian, anything else you'd like to share? Um, I'm going to give you, oh yes, I see Ben. Hello, hi. Yeah, sorry hi, my camera was off. I was actually listening and running at the same time, but um, let's stop now. Um, actually, so I'm not sure because I cut out for a little bit, but did you did you talk about how uh, the Listers originally ended up in Istanbul? Well, my grandfather was sent out to the Ottoman Bank. He joined the Ottoman oh. Bank in London okay. and he was sent out there. Um, a very exotic posting for him. So he, he didn't choose to go there, he was sent there. And right. my, my brother Alan also joined the Osman Bank, but he was sent of all places to Khartoum. And he met his wife in Khartoum, not that she was an Arab lady, but he met his English wife in Khartoum. So one doesn't think of the Osman Bank being as far south as the Sudan, but they did, they did, it's quite a, it covered the whole of the Arab world really. Okay, thank you. Last call? No? Okay, uh, we'll wrap up. But Ian, thank you very much indeed uh, for sharing your family history. Um, uh, it's great to have the record and, and with, with the colour of the anecdotes. Uh, and, and there's always this fascinating thing about languages and identity and place and nationality and, and where do you fit in all that and uh, I think that affects quite a few uh, of our members yes, um, yes. so it's great to hear it firsthand thank yes. you very much right.